drew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is their faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. We'll now watch a sermon that Pastor has provided for us here and recorded earlier. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this isn't a typical Sunday, and I'm not preaching from a typical pulpit. But Jesus is living and his church is still the church. So I hope that this video comes through okay. I've had all kinds of exciting uh, experiences trying to get it to record with failed technology after failed technology. So now we're down to my cell phone. So hopefully that will work well enough for our purposes today. My apologies if it's not the greatest. Before we get to our text for this morning, I wanna offer a few comments. First of all, why am I sharing a sermon in this means. Most of you probably know by now that I received a positive COVID test on Thursday, August 13th. I'm currently self-isolating away from my family who's in quarantine and all of you until I receive clearance from public health. I care for every one of you and I pray that you remain well. I'm doing my best to keep the ministry going from a distance and I thank you for understanding. I want to offer a few preliminary comments up front and then get to our text for today. So I'm not going to dedicate our sermon to COVID for a, a couple reasons. Number one, you're probably pretty tired of hearing about COVID. And number two, Jesus deserves more attention. Now, I know that may seem like a very simple point, but it's absolutely a critical one. We are here to focus on Jesus, not COVID. Jesus is King, not COVID. And Jesus is Lord, not COVID. And in reality, nothing has changed since last Sunday. I mean, COVID was real last Sunday. COVID's real this Sunday. Life under the sun was characterized by time, chance, and death last Sunday. It's characterized by time, chance, and death this Sunday. And there's no use playing the, the game why did this happen, right? Because there, there's no answer. We've talked about this before, right? But, but scripture doesn't reveal why we suffer, why we have to go through hard things. Now it addresses that subject in quite extensively, but it doesn't always answer you know, why specifically you have to go through the specific things you have to go through or why I have to go through this. It's certainly no fun for me. Uh, but what scripture does reveal is not why we suffer, but who suffered for us and who lives for us. And that is of immensely greater importance than, than getting those other questions answered. We talked about this last week when we studied the book of Job, but what we know is of infinitely greater importance than what we don't know. And we do know Jesus and he knows us. Now, because I know you care, I'm feeling okay. Tuesday night into Wednesday wasn't fun, but I'm improving every day. I recorded this message on Friday, so hopefully by the time you watch it on Sunday, I'm feeling even better by that point. I fully expect to be able to be back with you very soon. And you are most welcome to reach out to me and to my family in any socially distanced way that you would choose. We love the Zion family and we feel loved by the Zion family. Okay, so we're gathered to focus on Jesus, so let's get to it. For our time together in God's Word today, we're going to interact with our Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 15. It's a text that, as we'll see, raises a lot of questions. 
but it's really only focused on the answer to one of those questions. So it'll raise questions like, why is Jesus in the pagan country of Tyre and Sidon? How did this Canaanite woman hear about Jesus? Why did Jesus keep silence at her pleading? And why, why did Jesus call her a dog? And the text doesn't seem too concerned with the answer to those questions. Instead, it seems focused on one central question, and here it is. What does great faith believe about Jesus? What does great faith believe about Jesus? So we'll focus where the text focuses, and as difficult as it is, we will leave unanswered what the text leaves unanswered. So Jesus journeys to the pagan country of Tyre and Sidon. Why would the Jewish Messiah go there? Matthew doesn't tell us. Mark, who records the parallel account, says he went into a house there to get away from people, but that only raises more questions. So he's in a pagan territory, and a Canaanite woman approaches him. Now, historically, the Canaanites were known for all kinds of immoral practices, gross sexual sins, child sacrifice, and more. Pretty gruesome stuff. I don't know how much of that was being practiced at this time, but like we said, this was pagan country, so it's not surprising to find someone who's demon-possessed. They've been worshiping demons and false gods for generations. It was baked into their culture. Now, this would provide a neat opportunity to sit down and do some reflection upon our own culture, on the value of culture, in inculcating in people what we value as good, right, true, and beautiful. So we should ask what's, what values are baked in to our culture that we've simply accepted that we might need to reconsider. That's a conversation worth having sometime. And if you would like resources on that or would like to um, ask that question of me and have a conversation, I, I welcome that. I would love to have that conversation. Anyway, this woman comes out of a pagan culture and we fully expect her to be in lockstep with it. But what comes out of this woman's mouth is nothing short of astonishing. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now at this point in the narration, we don't know if this is sincere, but in Matthew's gospel, followers of Jesus are the only ones who call Jesus Lord. But if that's so, how in the world did she hear about Jesus in Tyre and Sidon? It's not like Jesus was live streaming and somebody could just hit the share button. And then the title, Son of David. I mean, that's Messiah talk. Son of David recognizes the promise of God that the Messiah would come from the line of David, a Jewish king. What is a Canaanite pagan doing talking this way? So she's crying out, Have mercy on me, O Lord, Son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And Jesus doesn't even acknowledge her. He had to have heard her, but he doesn't respond at all. And Matthew doesn't tell us why. Matthew is pressing on toward another question. What does great faith believe about Jesus? So, that's where we will head. The disciples start begging Jesus to give this woman what she, she wants, so she'll just stop crying into their ears. And Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep, or the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, you got to love the disciples. They are so real. Can you just give her what she wants so we can have some peace? She's not going to stop yapping in our ears until you give her what she wants, Jesus. It, it's just so true to reality. They're really not moved by her plight. They're concerned about themselves. I'm tempted to shake my head at them, but I know I'm no better. I suspect it would be a painful and revealing exercise to sort through our motivations for helping people. But Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There are no two ways about it. Jesus' words seem harsh. I mean, what he said is true. Yes, Jesus will expand later the mission to the Gentiles, but for now, he's sent to the Jews. 
I know we have this strong temptation to want to massage Jesus' words to get the edge out of them, but I'm not really sure we're able to do it. So I think probably the best approach is simply to let them stand. As hard as it is, just let them stand. The woman, whether she heard Jesus' response or not, because Matthew doesn't tell us, she's undeterred. She comes up to Jesus directly, bows before him, and implores him, Lord, help me. She will not be ignored. Her attention is focused on one person, Jesus. She's not going to let anyone keep her from him, not even Jesus himself. However she's heard about Jesus, she believes that he and he alone has the power to save. Now, if Jesus' words seemed harsh before, the edges only get more defined here. He says it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And maybe our American ears are just too sensitive. I don't know. It's really a remarkable statement. It's not a bald-faced insult, but, but basically Jesus is saying that she, as a non-Jew, doesn't have a place at the table. Now, I think it's probably important to point out that this is not a racial thing. This is a covenant thing. God has made his covenant with the Jews. People could join the covenant community through confessing faith in the God of the covenant, but that's something the Canaanites had rejected. So Jesus seems to be emphasizing that. It's not right to give Israel's gifts to Gentiles, to people who reject the true God. And this woman agrees. That's what's so amazing about her response and, and, and about what, what's, what's going to provide the answer to our question, what does great faith believe about Jesus? So she says, yes, Lord. And even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words, you're right, Lord. That wouldn't be right. And I'm not asking you to give me the children's meal. For the family pets know that children make crumbs. And I'm only asking for the crumbs. I know that the master of the house is generous and he provides more than enough for the children so that crumbs will fall to the floor for the dogs. And Jesus, who isn't impressed by much in Matthew's gospel, replies, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And now, you see, we have the answer to our question. What does great faith believe about Jesus? Great faith believes who Jesus is. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord. Great faith believes who Jesus is. We are privileged to confess who Jesus is in the creeds which summarize scripture. This Jesus is the son of David. He's the son of God. He took on flesh and tabernacled among us. He bore our sins on the cross and rose for our life three days later. He has bodily ascended into heaven where he lives and reigns with his father and the spirit until the day that the father has appointed when he will return and resurrect the dead, heal the earth and live among us forever. That's who Jesus is. So first, this great faith believes who Jesus is. And second, Great faith believes that Jesus has something for you. It may be healing, but Christ has not bound himself to this promise yet. In the resurrection, yet, yes, but not yet. So we may need to make sure we're not binding God to promises he hasn't made. But most assuredly, you are promised forgiveness. You are promised love. You are promised the kingdom. You are promised inclusion, and you are promised eternal life. You are promised the resurrection, renewal, and release from sin's curse. No more COVID, no more quarantine, no more self-isolation, no more uncertainty, no more, no more fear, no more. That's what Jesus has for you. Again, here is what great faith believes. Great faith believes who Jesus is, and great faith believes that this Jesus has something for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting, amen. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me in this way. I praise God for the technology, hopefully, that makes this possible. And I look forward to the opportunity of being back with you as soon as possible. I love you. Jesus loves you. And we give all glory to him. He is our Savior. Please rise and join in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated and enjoy the offering music by the Booth children. Thanks to the Booth family. Uh, we'll now do the prayer of the church. Uh, with each uh, response, we'll end with let us pray to the Lord. 
and uh, the response will be, Lord have mercy. Lord, we pray this morning that in all things that your name is glorified, that we as a church lift up your name and your word, uh, share your gospel with our community and with our culture, uh, and uh, speak the truth and love and righteousness in all things. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we want to pray for the sick and the needy, those who are suffering, hurting, and ill, especially in our congregation. We want to remember and uh, be concerned for Nancy Grimm, Arlene Moore, Dwayne Burr, Ron Schilling, Connie Sorby, Nancy Walters, Janice Monson, Ron Bruss, Sherry Steffes, Jim Devers, Rick Spack, Natalie Mason, Gage Carlson, Meredith Bowman, Patty Meaves, Jean Kuzel, Carolyn Werner, and Jeannie Grund. And of course, we want to pray for Pastor Connor, his family, their quick recovery, and look forward to when he can join us in service again. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, we want you to lift up our church, to allow us to be a light to our community, to our state, to our country and our nation. Um, help us to uh, be faithful witnesses, uh, to be your hands and feet to those in need in our community. We especially want to pray for our nation and our government, for community leaders, for Governor Reynolds, our state governor, for Donald Trump, our president, for all of our senators and congressmen and women, that they may govern rightly and righteously, uh, and that we may be uh, moved through your word to be faithful witnesses to them in how they ought to govern in a godly manner so that peace and security and righteousness uh, may once again dominate our culture. We want to pray for our police officers, for our military, and those who sacrifice every day in order to give us the freedom and security that you have blessed us with. Let us pray to the Lord. We want to pray and give thanks for the baptism of Hazel Elizabeth Opperman, the daughter of Jason and Kimber. Um, she was baptized on Saturday. Uh, we want to also pray for our missionaries and those who are serving you within the broader community, nation, and the world. We especially want to remember Dr. Reverend Stephen Oliver in Taiwan, Reverend Vogel, uh, pastors uh, of Friends in Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church, Reverend Charles Ferry in Indonesia, Reverend, Reverend James Sharp in Uruguay, and we want to remember our cross-cultural worker, Molly Olkerson, serving in India. Let us pray to the Lord. Please, Lord, bless our partnership with, uh, with Zion and Trinity. Um, allow us to use that to grow your kingdom. We want to bless our preschool uh, and uh, continue to give them safety and security in this uh, uncertain times. Uh, and to bring more families into our church community through their children. Um, all these things we want to pray in your holy name. Amen. And now we will do the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So a little note for the benediction. Everybody here. Most of everybody here knows the elders that participated, but for you, those of you people online, the elders that helped this morning are Mike Gore, Eric Ramsey, Tim Keenest, and myself, Paul Christensen. Now for the benediction. Lord, bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. That concludes our service.